everyone, and welcome to the Sunday evening update on this Sunday, October 25th. The place to get all your news and views of Life Extension from around the world and chat with advocates and researchers making it happen. I'm your host, Justin Lowe. Thanks for stopping by. A couple of notes. It's been a while since we had a show, of course, back in early December. If you remember, we had Dave Govell, wonderful interview. You can always go back and watch it in the saved videos here on the channel. And uh, we've had a lot of news as well, but I'm going to save the news for after the interview. A lot of things going on with the Institute and the world of life extension um, that we'll have that in about 20 minutes, 30 minutes after our uh, special guest for tonight. Uh, also, I hope you notice that the stream tonight is uh, perhaps a little bit higher quality. I downloaded a new audio and video codec uh, today for specifically for the show. I want to remind everyone who hasn't participated in the show before, I'm going to look at our chat room right now uh, and just take a look at everyone who's there and remind everyone that you can ask questions during the show and during the interview. We can have a little interactive discussion here. That's one of the great things about uh, having the show here on Ustream is that you can ask questions as we roll on through the interview, which brings me to the special guest for tonight who is the uh, research director or a director of the Department of Neuroengineering at Technalia, the third largest private research institution in Europe. And his name is Randall Kuna, and I would like to welcome him to the program at this point. Hello, Randall. Hi. Glad to be here. Well, it's wonderful having you here tonight. I'm going to put a little picture of you up on our screen and start out with a, uh, how about a introduction, uh, kind of a background for those who might not be familiar with you. Kind of, uh, could you let us know how you have, uh, you got involved with neuroengineering as you were uh, growing up, as you were uh, studying at university, uh, what drew you into the field, and, and what uh, have you been doing as of late at Technalia? Well, that's a long question. Well, kind um, of long, yeah. Just a brief yeah. kind of history <laughs> and uh, a little brief intro would be great. The, the reason I say it's long is because anyone who gets into neural engineering doesn't get there by a straight route. It's a uh, very interdisciplinary field, so you generally don't start off thinking, oh, I'm going to do neural engineering. Or maybe today you do, but when I started, that certainly wasn't an option. Oh. Um, I, I, I was basically inspired, even before I entered university, that I wanted to do something in the direction of mind uploading. So I was maybe 13 years old or so, and I read Arthur C. Clarke's The City and the Stars, and this kind of made a light bulb go off in my head, and I thought, okay, maybe you know, maybe there's something in physics, for example, where you would be able to do something like that. So I started studying physics at the University of Amsterdam back in 1989, and then I realized that the most significant thing that you had to replicate was, of course, the mind. So you, this was about computing, and therefore I did a master's in electrical engineering and information theory, and then, okay, you have to approach the, the human brain directly. So I decided to study computational neuroscience. And I did a PhD in that at the Department of Psychology of McGill University in Montreal. Okay. And that led me to studying human memory. So this was uh, a position that I had at Boston University, first as a postdoc and later as a research assistant professor in the Center for Memory and Brain. And uh, at the same time, I had an affiliation, at least for the last four years of my time there, I had an affiliation with the Vu University of Amsterdam, where I uh, worked in neuroinformatics, neuromorphology, neural development. And uh, finally, I was offered this chance, basically out of the blue, to hire my own team and pursue my own projects. And this was for this new health unit with a set of departments, biorobotics, gerontechnology, and neuroengineering mm -hmm. that they were starting at the, the Technalia uh, Foundation. So that's how I got there. And since then, it's been one year, so that's a very short amount of time to do anything. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, especially in this field. That is, that is a short period of time, isn't it? Um, I noticed that... Um, <clears throat> some of your, uh, anyway, on mineuploading.org and some information uh, that I had read is that um, you work uh, w in um, the field of neural prostheses. 
and yes. I was and I noticed uh, some of the examples that you had written about being uh, retinal implants and cochlear implants and and such things that um, prevent uh, seizures, I believe, and uh, some uh, people who have Parkinson's or uh, epileptic uh, conditions. And I was just wondering what uh, the latest technology you've seen that is being tested uh, with the human brain as far as neural processes go, things that uh, perhaps are just coming onto the scene, anything new uh, with uh, implants? Well, there are a lot of advances, um, but most of those advances, I would say, are kind of tangential because they address perceptual issues. It's, you know, about the cochlear implant and the retinal implant and all that stuff. This is really just the outside. It's, it's the perception, the sensory system. And then you've got the same sort of thing for motor activation if you want to help people who have uh, spinal cord injuries, for example. Um, you see this sort of work coming out of the Nicolaitis lab where they're uh, helping create brain machine interfaces where they allow, uh, for example, monkeys to, to uh, operate robot arms at a distance and things like that. Yeah, yeah. But the really interesting stuff is when you get into cognitive neuroprostheses. So when you try to do something about those processes that are really special to what we perceive as ourselves, as the, our way of thinking and how we operate. And I think really the only person that is really doing work in that area is still Theodore Berger at USC and his uh, work on a neuroprosthesis for a region of the hippocampus. Uh, there are some problems with his uh, proposed method because basically what he wants to do is treat it as a black box and learn the inputs and outputs of a certain region and then replace that with uh, a circuit that mm -hmm. can do the same thing. Uh -huh. But the problem being that if you want to use this to cure uh, people who have a lesion in the hippocampus is that you can't, you can't develop this I.O. mapping with those patients because the lesion is already present. You can really do that only in the healthy individual. So, you know, you start asking yourself, how exactly are you going to do this? So it looks more like it's really a technology that would be useful for enhancement or if you wanted to have uh, a neuroprosthesis of something like the hippocampus available in addition to a functioning brain. But, you know, I've, I've spoken to Theodore about it and uh, he believes that this is just, you know, one step in the way, and there are a lot of hurdles, but he's still looking for ways to get around that particular problem as well. So, I, I mean, you're talking about uh, replacing a uh, full functioning part of the brain, basically, here, uh, the hippocampus. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that, does that necessarily mean that there will be, say, intelligent software within that uh, embedded or imbued within that prosth prosthesis? Uh, that will be able to uh, interact and, and, and kind of get biofeedback from the the human brain? Uh, I guess the answer would have to be yes. I mean, if we consider parts of our brain to be intelligent and we want a system to be able to perform the same function as a part of the brain, then it would have to have at least that same intelligence and it would be able to carry out the function properly. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Okay, yeah, and okay, I, I understand what you're saying there. Uh, before we move on to anything else, uh, one of the audience members wanted missed the name of the uh, USC professor you said that was doing the hippocampus research. Uh, Theodore Berger, Ted Berger. Ted Berger, Theodore Berger. Okay, thanks so much for uh, having that again, uh, providing that information again. Now, as far as brain emulation goes, let's move from uh, neural prostheses to brain emulation. Um, what is the most advanced uh, project that you've seen in the world so far today, different universities or research institutions, as, uh, that are working on brain emulation? There are lots of different avenues you can take when you talk about the most advanced, because you can talk uh, about the most advanced in terms of the largest scale, how much of a brain is being emulated, or how detailed is the emulation, or uh, is it real time? Oh, there are all sorts of issues there, but I think when you think about, okay, large-scale brain emulation, then probably the most common answer would be the Blue Brain Project, 